Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish up today with a special selection, which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. If you have your own song you'd like to request for special selections, you can find a link to do so in the description below. Today's request comes at us from Art of Circle. It says, I'd like you to check out some more Shade Empire, this time Anti-Life Survivor. Anti-Life Savior, another masterpiece of a journey by this band that makes use of excerpts from Ian Richardson's reading of Paradise Lost. And that's interesting because it comes off of Saturday's look at Lightbearer's Silver Tongue album, which also had elements of Paradise Lost in it. So let's dive into this. We'll listen to it, talk about some music, dive into some lyrics, just like always. All right, so we have Shade Empire's Anti-Life Survivor. Anti-Life Savior. Why can't I say that? Listen to what is in some ways the first great speech of the poem in book one of the 12 books. Satan, cast down by God to hell with the other rebel angels, sees close by him one next himself in power and next in crime. Beyond Interesting the use of panning right here. And Satan addresses him like this. If thou beest he, but oh how fallen, how changed from him. For when the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness did stand shine, myriad snow bright. If he or mutual need united thoughts and counsels, we could hope that hazard in the glory of enterprise. Really great use of uh, spatialness with all the uh, the ornamental sounds here. Having the violins play whole notes on top of the tremolo picking on the guitars works so good. The little triplet idea there on beats three and four, bar one of this pattern. Oh, interesting notes there. Those little pickup sixteenths on the bass kicks.
really interesting how they crafted this section from the previous ideas to pave way for this melodic lead. Got those nice stings in the violin. Halftime driven by the guitars and drums. Really great swells on the side. Getting real bluesy. Yeah, reintroducing that triplet idea from the snare earlier into the guitar line. Really interesting vocal layering right here. Yeah, really great way to use the strings right there to continue the tension through uh, the section where the guitar is not playing. Yeah, bringing the triple it back. Recontextualizes the trip a little actually. It starts on the off beat instead of the down beat. That soaring guitar line.
and then doubling up on the harmony and the strings. We got a choir in the background too. That's a gnarly vocal though. Something I want to point out right there at the end, uh, it was, I think that was the cleanest that I had heard the vocals since the beginning, and there's something very calm about them. You know, a lot of the time when we have uh, harsh vocals, they'll be, they, they feel like they're, they're large, right? And it really feels like they're pushing a lot of air through to get these large, loud sounds. And this one just feels very calm and relaxed, just constrained, right? And I don't know the actual technique they're going about utilizing to create this sound. So I'm not gonna comment on whether I think it's sustainable or not. Obviously it probably is if they continue to use it often, but it just feels very, it feels like a normal volume speaking volume, speaking range, maybe pushed up a little bit, uh, and just a lot of comfortable compression put on it. Just like, <laughs> just like it's, it's calm. It's very low energy, low effort, you know? And again, you know, I've talked about this before. When I say low effort, I don't mean that it doesn't take uh, a lot of effort to do or that they're not putting any work into it, just that it sounds effortless right? So I'm real curious as to what's going on there. I wouldn't mind hearing, uh, you know, if somebody has the stems for this and can just cut everything out. I'm really interested what the vocals sound like on their own, isolated. Because uh, right there, it just it kind of sounds goblin-y, right? Like a normal speaking voice for a goblin. <laughs> it doesn't have the power or intensity that I typically think of when I think of harsh vocals. So that's pretty cool, just right there in itself. Um, what genre is this, though? Huge symphonic element. But let's push that aside for a little bit, right? What else? What's, what's going on here metal-wise? Because this is obviously a metal track. We have lots of tremolo picking. We have lots of double bass kicks. Um, I think I heard one or two blast beat sections, but they were not very prominent. Uh, lots of cymbals, harsh vocals. To me, there's definitely a black metal section or a black metal vibe here, but I'm not quite sure how much of this could be described as black metal. Is this death metal? You know, as usual, I'm not, I'm just not well versed in uh, the nuances. To me, this is just still pretty much extreme metal, right? Uh, it's, it's extreme for me, so that's, that's kind of where I want to put it. But what I, what I mean by, when I, when I bring this up, the whole point of bringing up genre in the first place, is comparing it to other things we've heard. And I think it's interesting, uh, just because we did just check this out, is some of the ways that this is similar to and different from uh, Lightbearer's Silver Tongue. I do want to get into uh, you know the lyrics of this and music. I don't I don't really want to focus too much on this comparative aspect, but it's just I can't avoid it given that I literally just listened to Silver Tongue two days ago, and this appears to be, from the few vocal lines I picked up, the few lyrics I picked up, uh, sort of similar vein, right? And we'll get into it later. Maybe I'm just extrapolating a couple of lines that work and the whole song isn't. But, you know, there's definitely similar sounds here. Uh, you know, the, the, the tremolo picking, the double bass kicks, the, the weight, uh, the brightness. You know, I, th I think it's interesting 
that uh, two bands have listened or have read uh, Paradise Lost and have taken away from it similar atmospheric vibes to create songs that utilize common or similar compositional choices. I I just want to point that out because I think it's cool. They do they do divert heavily in the execution, but some of the foundational ideas are similar enough between them that I can see a, a you know a pattern there. But one of the huge places of diversion, let's dig into this, the orchestra. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little underwhelmed by it, but I still think it was utilized expertly. And the way I'm saying that I'm underwhelmed by it is the same reason I typically say I'm underwhelmed by the use of orchestra. Is that it typically, a lot of bands tend to use orchestra or uh, symphonic instruments in metal ways, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of symphonic bands that I've been introduced to are kind of guilty of this. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just my personal preference. I'm not a big fan of it. If you're going to bring in some strings or some brass or an entire string section and an entire brass section, like we saw in this song, I'm going to expect them to be utilized in ways that are close to how I'm typically used to hearing them in a classical setting. I'm going to I'm going to hope to hear more classical chord or chord progressions. I'm going to hope to hear the strings utilized in ways beyond simple chords. Um you know, I'm going to expect some orchestral stingers. I'm going to expect swells and dynamic work. I don't necessarily need you to make uh, you know, to put Beethoven-style uh, music in your metal, right? It's still metal music at its heart, but I do expect some more dynamic elements like I'm used to in a lot of classical music. And we do see some of that here. There are some interesting note, uh, note choices. That's the word I want. <laughs> Uh, we have some really nice swells or some stingers. We hear a couple of different violin techniques uh, to create different vibes. But it also is, is very safe as far as how much influence from the classical side we hear. Now, we have checked out Shade Empire before. I know that they can go real hard into the classical inspiration uh, so I'm not going to hold it too much against them here. I'm going to assume it was done artistically for a specific vision, and it just doesn't happen to bring about that much classical work into it. It's more of a metal side. With that said, though, I do think it is a nice middle ground. The strings do typically in here get utilized more for textural stuff. The strings and those brass are here to make it sound epic, and it does make it sound epic. I can't really say, I'm in the choir too at the end. It's to give it that extra heft, the extra weight. And none of it is really to introduce classical ideas. It's more just about making the rock ideas or the metal ideas sound bigger, sound better, sound more epic, you know, and it works. I think they did a fantastic job with that. But there's also enough classical elements in here to, to tell me that they understand uh, a bit more of how to use these instruments rather than just, uh, I guess you could call it like set dressing, right? It's a, like some other bands have metal songs, but it looks fancy because we got the strings in there, that kind of vibe. Whereas this one, they, they understand a little bit more. Like I said, we have the swells, we have a couple different violin techniques. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's definitely elements in here where the instruments aren't just being utilized for their timbre. And, you know, we've also seen bands on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, I said this is right in the middle. This is the other end of the spectrum I'm talking about. Uh, like, uh, I think it's Dimu Borgir that we've checked out before, where I said it was so much classical music that the metal instrumentation was basically not really utilized much at all. In fact, it was kind of the opposite, where the electric guitar really just kind of gave the classical music a bite. It was there for its its relationship to metal, to make it sound a little more metal, rather than actually introducing metal uh, composition techniques into the classical writing. I think this is sort of a middle ground here. We have some classical ideas, we have some metal ideas. We don't really lean one way or the other. It's 
fairly safe from both perspectives. There's nothing really technical metal wise here, but there's also nothing technical classical wise here. It is pretty much a perfect middle point between the two where we get a little bit of each individual's flavor. We get a little bit of the metal, a little bit of the classical, and both of them sort of switch up at times, whether they're used for more of a textural sound or we're using the compositional elements of the timbre. Or we're using the compositional elements of the genre that the timbre is typically associated with, which is way too many words. I wish we had a nice, concise word for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, it, it's a nice middle ground. It's, it feels kind of safe in both directions, but it works right? And I don't know if you've noticed when I was listening to that, I'm not sure how physically reactive I was to it, but I really enjoyed a lot of it. Some really cool ideas all throughout. Um, so we talked about vocals and we talked about the mixing of instruments. Um, I think the next thing I want to look at then is just the overall vibe which is interesting because it shifts uh, quite a bit, I think. The feeling of the song never really changes, at least not that I remember. Um, you know, it is a fairly driving song at all times. It has epic uh, elements to a lot of it. You know, there's a couple of moments where you bring it back a little bit, kind of uh, pare it down a little, but... You know, a majority of the song, like 70, 80% of it, is this driving, massive sound, right? Uh, now, interestingly, if this is black metal, which like I said, I'm, it might be, it might be, uh, here's the thing, it might be death metal, because I think I like death metal, a little bit at least. Black metal, I still have a hard time getting into, which makes me think this is black metal, <laughs> It's pretty bad, but I think that that's my criteria for figuring out which is which. Did I like it? It's probably death metal. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really did enjoy this. But anyways, so we have, you know, a lot of this driving epicness, a lot of energy. It doesn't matter who's driving that energy. It could be the strings. It could be the guitars. It could be the vocals. Um, could be the bass, the drums, like all the instruments kind of get a chance to drive the energy, mostly based on rhythm, right? The drums get it a lot because they're usually getting the rigid, um, you know, eighth notes and stuff like that, the double bass kicks with the, uh, the 16th notes. They're driving the energy a lot, but we also have those moments with like the tremolo picking that drives the energy there, um, or some of the string lines that are moving a bit faster. Uh, you know, everybody kind of gets a chance to drive the song on their own. Um, but the emotion of the song varies, and I think that's interesting. I'm not quite sure where this comes from. Part of me wants to say that it's lead timbre. But there's also some sections that I think are flavored by chord choices. I don't know if it's a key change, maybe it's a mode change... Maybe it's just, uh, you know, a series of accidentals that, uh, for those who don't know, an accidental, if your key says that all of your E's are going to be E flats, this would be a little mark that says, actually, this E is natural, that kind of vibe, right? It is a, it's a momentary change to a different version of a note, which is a weird way to put it, but I hope that kind of solidifies it. They call it an accidental. It makes it sound like an accident, but it's not. It's very clearly intentional. This time when you see the E, you're not playing E flat like the key suggests. You're going to play E natural. Or, uh, you know, if it's a G and the key is in G flat, well, when you play this one, it could be a G natural. It could be a G sharp, but it's not going to be that G flat that the key tells you it's going to be. Um, so, yeah, a series of accidentals would basically kind of indicate a momentary key change where it's not just one note but every time we see this note or actually a few notes in a row even though it could be different notes in this bar are going to feel like a different key because we're playing different versions of these notes uh, but I don't know you know what it is but some of these sections feel bolsterous energetic driving epic uh, they're very adventurous right uh, there's even moments where it feels 
um, joyous, victorious even. Uh, you know, basically that the drive is over and we've reached the end of the journey kind of vibe. Other times it feels to be about the journey. Just the energy and adventure of being on said journey. And there are moments even when we have this energy and drive, but we feel loss or melancholy. Uh, I don't know if it's a pensiveness or a sorrow, but definitely something that's a little less joyous than the other sections, which seem to be a mix of carefree and just elation, right? Um, and we sort of jump between these these three vibes, sort of... Uh, uh, a little lower, right in the middle, and, you know, more excited. More excited, middle excited, less excited. Um, and it's really interesting to hear, you know, the vibe of the song doesn't really change. It's not like we are removing a bunch of instruments and going into a ballad section. A lot of this song still keeps the energy throughout. It's just, it gets a little heavier to listen to, I suppose. It's just not as joyous. And uh, like I said, it's one, one of those things we're going to be looking at in the lyrics. And if I listen to it again, that would be one of the things I listen for is trying to find the source of these emotional changes. Now, I probably should have talked about this last section because it kind of fits in with this vibe of metal versus classical. But I love the way that the two are interweaved when they are allowed to line up. You know, a lot of these moments are the guitars are doing their metal thing and the brass is doing their thing, right? We get these really big, strong, uh, you know, brass blasts. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, but just when, when like, you get the brass, I mostly hear trombone and tr or tuba and trumpet. Maybe there's a trombone hidden in there. Uh, but it's when you just, you play just a little too much you get just a little too much air going through it and it sort of puts a, a compression in the sound and uh, you really have to know what you're doing with it because it can sound one muddy depending on the style of music it can sound kind of nasty but when you're making something epic and you want that larger than life brass sound that's what you want to do and we hear a couple of those especially stingers like i said they can get real muddy especially when you have full sections not being a solo trumpet but you know a trumpet section or entire brass section doing it so you get these short stingers which they utilized here which allows the muddiness to kind of fall over itself and dissipate fade out before you go to the next note it's a really great way to utilize it so you know we heard some of those where was i going with this oh yeah isolated ideas um and you know we had the like a quasi guitar solo there at one point kind of a guitar doing its own thing right but there were some moments when they came together, and I love these. Uh, early on, we had tremolo picking in one of the electric guitars, and the violin was harmonizing with it with extended notes. So where the, tremolo, where the guitarist would rapidly pick the same note over and over, the violin would just continue to bow along the string. So in essence, where bo both instruments are playing a single note for an extended period of time, it's just the guitar is constantly attacking on the note. So instead of having a singular unbroken sound of said note, like the violin, we get a constant da 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 You get that attack in there rather than da rather than that smoothness. Um, and that's the whole point of tremolo picking, is to introduce these rapid-fire attacks inside of it. And a lot of the time in black metal, and I guess maybe death metal, I don't know, black metal is kind of what I associate this with, but a lot of extreme metals utilize this tremolo picking technique. Uh, anyways, the point of it is to create these all these attacks inside of holding an... Or, uh, no, what I was saying is a lot of songs in this genre stay on a note and it's kind of like adding intensity or tension even to a held out note uh, it's an interesting way to go about writing a song it gives you all the benefits of constantly hitting the string like you're playing fast without actually having to change notes all the time so you can focus still on uh, melody and harmony but what's interesting here is that the violin and the guitar are harmonizing with each other. 
And when the guitar changes a note, the violin changes as well. I don't remember if they were like perfectly uh, separated or if maybe the distances were growing and changing. Um, but yeah, we had these really nice dyads between the violin and, and guitar right there. And it's just a really great way of harmonizing and doing textural layering. We have that nice warm sound texture of the bowed string and we have a bit of the harsher texture of the tremolo picking both of them coming together and so we hear a little bit of the beauty not beauty uh smoothness and rigidness of these two styles but we're also getting the harmony of the dyad there just really great way to go about doing that i love it it uh it creates a an interesting overall sound right if they played the exact same note it would just be texture layering but because we're layering the notes so creating harmony and layering the textures it just it, it it's this interesting sound to Myers it's not something I hear too often and I absolutely love it um trying to think if there was another incident where one of the orchestral instruments was lining up with something the metal instruments were doing that might have just been it, though, at least from what I can remember um, as far as as that. But I mean, even that alone right there is worth bringing in the extra set of instruments. So I guess we're going to dive into the lyrics real quick and uh, see where that takes us. Uh, I think this is going to really color a lot of what I think about this track. Uh, we're going to see how this lines up with, there's a lot of words here. Holy cow. All right. So this is track five on this album. Listen to what is in some ways the first great speech of the books in book one of the 12 books. So this is, uh, this was Ian Richardson. Yep, Ian Richardson reading Paradise Lost, I believe. This was a, a sample of that. Satan cast down by God to hell with the other rebel angels, sees close by him one, next himself in power, next in crime, Beelzebub, Satan's lieutenant, and Satan addresses him like this. So it starts out with Satan speaking to Beelzebub. If thou beest he, but oh how fallen, how changed, from him who in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, didst outshine myriads through bright, if he who mutual leagues, league united thoughts in counsel, equal hope, and hazard in a glorious enterprise, joined with me once, how misery hath joined in equal ruin, into what pit thou seest. From what hath fallen so much the strongest proved he with his thunder, and still then who knew the force of those dire arms, yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage, in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change, though changed in outward luster that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the highest raised me to contend into the fierce constant content contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne i'm pretty sure that comes from paradise lost primarily because it's written in old english uh some of these uh, spellings very interesting to read but anyways, it seems that he is speaking to Beelzebub and asking him if he will, you know, they've both been cast out, I believe, at this point. And he says, hey, you're going to join me in this in this, in this, this next battle, basically. You know, we fought God and failed, and he's punished us for this. We're both in misery, but we're joined in that. Now we're down here, and we're going to find other ways to, you know, to, to take, him on, take him down a notch, right? That's kind of the vibe I'm getting here. Then we get into the song proper. I can tell that because the language has changed. He says, With every dream of dark fantasies, blood is dripping out from the ceiling, taking forms that remind you of all the shadows of the past. 
So it just sounds like Satan at this point is being haunted by his failure. Um, even though he dreams of fant, you know, he fantasizes about maybe if he'd won or what he might do if he'd win. It says that, uh, that the blood that drips from the ceilings take the forms of shadows of the past, which would be his failings, I would say. The body is dead now. You can never take it back from the sun, from the brightest light. Reveal your heart at its purest. I don't know what's going on there. Born of flames, baptized in fire, pure chaos inside this shell of flesh. Ooh, maybe we're not talking about Satan right here. O oh, deceptor, burn the eyes of your God. This is my wolf pack. You are my prey. Hmm. Oh, maybe he's talking to mortals. You have a shell of flesh that has pure chaos inside. So listen to me. Burn the eyes of your God. This is my wolf pack. You're my prey. Hmm. Twisted faces take form with the way further of your window's glass. Humanity, now what have you done? As years go on, you just wipe them away with a grin behind your mask. Come face the light of my guidance, you say, but blinded are those who walk toward the light. Blessed. Oh, oh. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Okay. Some of this has gone over my head, but that is a solid burn. Blinded are those who walk toward the light. You know, physically, I mean, I know right now I have two really big lights. If I look directly at either one of them, I, I get that, you know, the, the light bulb effect or that, you know, I see the lights. I try not to look at those lights. They're very bright. <laughs> So if you are walking directly towards a bright light, especially one as bright as God would be himself, you're going to be blinded easily. So we have that that physical one, but then also that he says that, I mean, even I think the line before it, he says, um, oh, he says, as years go on, you just wipe them away with a grin behind your mask. So he's saying that uh, God is two-faced, right? says you're wearing a mask to these people, maybe, or maybe even to himself or, or to Satan, you know, he's, he's just disingenuous, right? So anybody who follows you is following a false idea. So you're blinded if you follow God. You're blinded if you walk towards the light. Man, that is a good line. Blessed are we who dwell in the night. Yeah, just kind of take the inverse of that. So when he says... Um, he says, as years go on, you just wipe them away. Is he referring to the great flood here? And if so, does that mean that all, all of this takes place in early uh, Old Testament? You know, pre-flooding with Noah. Uh, in which case, that would be the question, humanity, what have you done now? Right? This was when uh, sin was so bad that God basically said, well, humanity 1.0 was a failure. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's start a new game of sim life. Um, so is that, is that where that was coming from? Which means the, the beginning, the body is dead now. You can never take it back from the sun, from the brightest light. So from God, you reveal your heart at its purest. I mean, you could be talking about Cain and Abel right there. Hmm. So then the first idea, with every dream of dark fantasies, blood is dripping up from the ceiling, taking forms that remind you of all the shadows of the past. That might not be Satan talking to himself about his failures. That could be about another failure of humanity. I don't know. If so, we're jumping around between stories a lot. Anyways, come back to this idea that all those who are blind that walk into the light. We move to the next lines. It says, All is not lost, the unconquerable will, and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome. That glory never shall 
his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with supp suppliant knee and defy his power who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire that were low indeed that were an ignominy ignominy and shame beneath this downfall since by faith the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail since through experience of this great event in arms not worse in foresight much advanced we may with much success hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war irreconcilable to our grand foe who now triumphs so this is just you know we lost our first war but uh you know i'm getting the troops ready for the next one. We're not going to go down. Uh, we're not going to have the shame of our downfall. We will have the strength of the gods. We're not going to bow. We're going to have the courage to never submit. All right? We're going to study revenge and immortal hate. We are going to continue to fight this fight. We come to the final verse. You keep looking for answers, but you don't like the ones I can give. Dig your grave deeper. Until you're at the point you can't reach the edge, come face the light of my guidance, you say, but blinder to those who walk toward the light, blessed are we who dwell in the night. Yeah, so, I mean, this kind of, this whole song is kind of, at least from my eyes, uh, you know, Satan having just lost and deciding to look upon uh, Earth, right, the humanity. Uh, to wage a second war. This one won't be fought with weapons. It will be fought through a species. Very close to, I think it was Matriarch, uh, the third track of Silver Tongue. And uh, kind of, uh, he says, hey, you know, humanity, you've done this, and you've done this, and you've done this, and that's all in the image of your God. You know, he's allowed you to do all this maybe uh, it's not the best path to walk at all. Let me, let me show you what I've got kind of deal. And uh, that's kind of the whole song right there. So I think like that goblin voice, that kind of works. Uh, seeing how everything's kind of through Satan's mouth. And I mean, it fits the music too. <laughs> For once, I don't think the, the harsh is actually... Uh, they didn't really wear on me at all. I, I, I kind of enjoyed them, actually. I think they kind of worked. That's weird to say. <laughs> um, and interesting, though, here's the, here's the other thing that I really like, though, is that a lot of the strings here... Oh, there's another thing, though. The song is, like, epic, right? I don't really get much epicness from the lyrics, though. And I'm wondering if maybe it's just Shade Empire style to write that big and bolsterous. Or if they have a different vision of the song than I do. I mean, because like when I was talking about Matriarch uh, on Saturday, I kind of talked about how it's kind of a sneaky thing, right? That, uh, you know, Satan took on God uh you know very upfront very personal i went to war with them and lost well you know you can't take them you can't take them in a head-to-head -head battle so what do you do next oh you know we're gonna have a war over what he's created kind of vibe right uh you know we're gonna have a a war that isn't confrontational face to face and so it's kind of something sneaky about that it's like when the villain of uh you know superhero films uh, you know, takes a hostage and not even a superhero from just any, you know, the villain takes a hostage though. And the villain doesn't have the rules, right? The hero can't let innocent life be harmed. So they have to back down or, uh, you know, surrender or whatever. They have their own moral code. And it's kind of the, uh, the underhanded tactic of the villain because they don't have that same rules. And that's kind of what I get from Lucifer's decision to move the war to humanity. Um, so in that vein, it, it feels kind of odd to bring this, uh, you know, big bombastic look at me. You know, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're taking the war back. We're going to try this again, kind of vibe. And it's, uh, he really isn't. <laughs> He's finding a different front to fight the war on. Uh, but the 
you know, the epicness also comes in the form of when he's speaking to Beelzebub, and possibly at the end when he's speaking to his army of fallen angels. I'm not quite sure. Maybe he's speaking to humans who have come to see him as, uh, you know, their their god or whatever, who are fighting on behalf of him. Uh, and in that sense, it can have this uplifting sort of pre-war speech where you're readying the troops, rallying the troops kind of vibe. Uh, but I don't think the whole song really works with that. It's just the two sections. So I don't know. Like I said, it could be just how they write music it has nothing to do with the atmosphere of the song, but um, it is an interesting choice to go with because the lyrics don't feel too bombastic to me. The lyrics are about, ah, oh, dang, we screwed up once. Let's try again. And this time we're going to try something that probably is more in our favor, but not, you know, it feels triumphant at times, even it's, it's huge, it's big. And I, I just don't get that vibe from the lyrics, but I don't know. I do enjoy the music. I'm going to have to check out more of Shade Empire, which I'm pretty sure I said last time we checked out Shade Empire and I never did. I think they are on my list of stuff to check out. Just haven't gotten quite around to it yet. The list just keeps growing, man. There's so much good music out there. Uh, so I guess this wraps up my look at Shade Empire's Anti-Life Savior. That is a really good title for it, though. That's a really good title for it. Because, you know, this would be the antithesis of what well, would be Christ, which would be the life savior. So he, he dubs himself the anti-life savior. Interesting. Interesting. Anyways, this is where you guys come in. I'm sure I missed a lot here. This song is a lot to take in musically. It's a lot to take in lyrically. Uh, I probably could have also been wrong on some of these verse readings. They might have more to do with uh, Paradise Lost than the Old Testament. So... You know, if you have any comments, anything you want to add to this, any corrections you want to make on my part, or if you just want to expand on things I did say, go ahead and drop that stuff in the comment section. Above that is a description box, and there's a link for Linktree. It takes you to this menu right here. It has everything related to the channel here. You can find merch, join a Patreon to vote on future themed songs, submit your own special selection, join the Discord, follow me on Twitter, a bunch of stuff in there. Go ahead and check it out. Above that, if you could like, subscribe, and ring the bell, I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll be looking at more not rock or metal, as well as another special selection. Until next time, remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to. Sorry, cold chill. And have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.